Greetings, comrades. First off, news update on the day of this recording. Putin has been missing for 11 days already. He didn't show up in the Gazprom 25th anniversary party, even though he is directly tied to it, as they are a state company and, and he and his pals directly control it. Instead, they showed a video recording of his speech, which the authorities stated was recorded just a day ago, but really it was a literal remix of Putin's older speeches, as you could see his tie changing colors multiple times and others, some small similar changes in the video. Like I said in my previous episode, this might get interesting. That's uh, over for the news update, and now, on the episode. We have fun incoming here. As we spoke on the last Stalin show, Stalin married Nadezhda Aluliyeva, who was 17 at the time, and he was 39, in 1919, and then participated in the Soviet-Polish war, where he again tried to sabotage Trotsky's ideas. Before moving on with the timeline, I would like here to speak a bit more about Stalin's personal life, To get that personal touch, you know, uh, so that we could understand his personality better. Now, obviously, passion never really played a uh, huge role in Stalin's life, especially after the death of Soso, his first wife, which was extremely tragic, and after which he said that he had lost uh, lost everything there. Even though that he was, like, 20 years older than Aluliyeva, you know, you can suppose that he married her for companionship, and maybe out of respect of her practical qualities. Certainly, and that can be said with with real conviction, he did not marry her for her intellect, because Stalin hated intellectual women, referring to them disparagingly as, quote, headings with ideas. Uh, Sometimes you can also uh, attribute to him the uh, so-called Asiatic pleasure he derived from asserting his authority over a meek and demure woman, together with the view that it would do no harm to have his wife for a secretary. There was another less tangible motive. See, in his underground years, we obviously heard of him, uh, returning to the Aluliyev household with its happy marriage and its two lovely young daughters like all the time, basically. And uh, I believe that he kind of found there a domestic happiness that he had never known or seen before, because, you know, with his first wife he was always on the run. That was a home life which was very different from his own poverty-stricken and brutalized childhood with his, you know, aggressive father which he tried to murder and and other things like that, and with with his uh, debaucheries and and weird escapades at, at the seminar. A discovery, very late discovery on his life, that family life can be happy could have left an impression and and made uh, one long for the kind of happiness too. It is possible that Stalin married Nadezhda out of a wish for the kind of domestic warmth that he had known only as a visitor to this Aluliyev household. Nadezhda Aluliyeva was not a secretary of the mouse-like variety, though. She belonged to a pre-revolutionary generation of women who were uncompromising in their idealism, severe in their manner, and wore their hair in braids. Over the years, she made many friends and no enemies. Nadezhda Aluliyeva was an outstanding personality. Among the Kremlin women folk, there were many who put on airs, but she was always simple. Her every gesture was unassuming. There was never anything strained or forced about her. She was always the soul of frankness and honesty. That is a quote from my uh, my socialistic sources from Marxism.org. A young Russian woman of such character raised in a revolutionary household in those years could never have given herself to a man whom she did not admire and respect. The concept of respect here, as we've seen in the previous episodes, was vital to an understanding of of these Russian relationships of this era. The ultimate reproach addressed by a woman to her seducer, or by one drunk to another, is, you don't respect me. It's like... Uh, if you respect me, you will also drink a glass of vodka with me. That's a common saying up until this day. The fact that Nadezhda Aliyev married Stalin proves that he had won her respect. A curious token of the Bolshevik spirit with its blend of idealism and ruthlessness. Since the things said about her understanding, there's a reason to believe that she, too, had blood on her hands. Or at least on her typewriter. She had accompanied Stalin on his Tsaritsyn expedition, as we heard before, and, you know... It can be assumed that she saw him in action and handled paperwork, you know, with the arrests and shootings and executions and, you know, all the other good stuff that Stalin ordered as usual. 
Whatever her later opinions of Stalin, this glimpse of him in action had, like, done almost nothing to diminish her respect of him. So, with Alulieva, Stalin created a family life uh, of a sort. Nadezhda gave him two children. Vasily, which will, which will be born in 1921, which we'll talk about later on, and Svetlana in 1926. The couple lived quite comfortably, especially in taking into account all this era and everything like that. They had a town apartment in the Kremlin and a fine home in the country, Zubalovo, which Stalin completely rebuilt, transforming it from a country house into an airy mansion. And yeah, there he displayed his passion for architecture, which would never leave him as Stalin's crazy ideas about how to rebuild rebuild Moscow and how to build up stuff in other Soviet cities will be a major topic in our future episodes. A little later, Stalin obtained the use of a summer estate also called Zobalova on the Black Sea. Uh, the name is uh, kind of a joke here. It's a Stalin's weird twisted sense of humor. See, both of these residences had belonged to one Zobalov who used to be an oil magnate during the Tsarist era, and he had owned refineries in Batumi and Baku that had both been targets for strikes organized by Stalin before. And uh, during these days, it was very fashionable to cancel names associated with the Tsarist era, the old monarchical days, but Stalin, in his own nicely murderous way of thinking, preferred to keep his Zubalovos all unaltered as an ironic reminder that he was their master now. Stalin ran the Moscow Zubalova as a thriving country estate with livestock, beehives, gardens, orchards, and beautifully tended birch woods. Uh, this, this quote comes from Montefiore book here. He, apparently, had loved to spend time in his gardens, working or pottering about with some garden shears doing a little pruning, a form of gardening which brought him great contentment. And uh, again, here I'm going to be quoting from Alex de Jong's book further on. Judged by pre-revolutionary standards, the couple lived a life of comfortable upper-middle-class family. In the land devastated by civil war and experimental socialism, in which people gave one another logs for presents and there was cannibalism in the countryside, it was a life of luxury. When it is said that the, that the Bolshevik leaders lived modestly, were driven about in used American cars, and only occasionally dri dined off the imperial gold plates, we should recall that this was a time when the majority of the population could scarcely be thought of as living at all. End quote. But yeah, Nadezhda, and we will dedicate a whole episode on her in the future, as I have quite a lot of materials about her, he was a, she was a character of herself. Uh, later on, she stopped working for Stalin, she found a job in Lenin's secretariat, where she nearly suffered a curious fate. Shortly after she, she had joined, she, um, of all people, was purged, that is to say she was expelled from the party, because, apparently, she did not do enough party work. And, you know, when Lenin heard the news of this, he wrote to the purge committee reminding, uh, reminding in that her family had actually helped him in a difficult time and, you know, that these guys were actually politically reliable. Quote from Stalin here. It is possible that in view of the youth of Nadezhda Sergeyevna Aulieva, the commission has remained in ignorance of this circumstance. End quote. So, you know, sort of blatnoy things, even though Nadezhda doesn't do much party work, even though she's in the party, and when someone's trying to do some actual, actual work here, yeah, they have to be reminded that, after all, she is Stalin's wife and Lenin's personal friend. Also, obviously, and I plan to include this in uh, Ask Uncle Joe segment, but um, right now it's a better thing because it's his personal life. Uh, remember, we spoke about spoke about Stalin's body doubles in, in one of the previous Stalin episodes, but he had some other bodyguards, a number of them. And yeah, one of these guys would serve as his chief security officer uh, until a m month or so before Stalin's death, which made him the longest serving member of all the Stalin's crew. His name was Nikolai Sergeyevich Vlasik, and he was one from Red Army. He was detailed to head Stalin's guard. And, you know, in this role, he was closer to him than anyone else, really, if, if you think about it. And uh, later on, we'll see that um, he acquired kind of large power in later years. He combined the roles of bodyguard and uh, some sort of household keeper. And even, you know, Stalin personally promoted him to the rank of Major General. Nadezhda, however, uh, at least when she was around, 
uh, kept this Vlasic in, in place, basically, because he was a terribly arrogant person. It was only after her death that he took over the household, and, like, even more. Uh, we spoke about Stalin's hobbies and how he liked western westerns and uh, ballet, and especially ice hockey. And yeah, Stalin's bodyguard, he would accompany him uh, to Stalin, to the theater, opera, ballets, and everything else, and... Vlasic would be the one who would give Stalin's responses, and uh, <clears throat> these socialist sources that I'm reading say he would interpret these uh, these perfor- these responses to the performers. Vlasic also was the one who gave advice to Kremlin's cooks, to the filmmakers, through Stalin's uh, advice, of course, and even to architects. Vlasic liked to exploit his power with a really, really huge arrogance and kind of this insolence you know, which which is often seen in, in uh, those guys who are servants of the rich and powerful. And because Vlasic really, according to all reports, even even my, my socialistic services, because they spent uh, quite a lot of time in Stalin's biography writing about Vlasic later on, even they declared that, st- that this Vlasic was <clears throat> crude, insufferable oaf, the sort that gives so-called rough diamonds a bad name. And also, and grudgingly, even they have to admit this, that uh, this guy appeal, appealed to Stalin quite a lot, as we can see that, you know, unlike most other people from this era, he wasn't shot. Because Stalin apparently enjoyed the company of those who seemed to, um, quote, and uh, this is another quote from Alex de Jong, <clears throat> incarnate humanity's lowest common denominator. He knew where he was with them. So yeah, Stalin gets bodyguards, Stalin gets powerful, Stalin gets married. <laughs> that would be the Stalin's personal life, for a while now at least. We shall touch on his children a bit later. For now, for now, let's move on a bit with the timeline. First off, let's start off the year of 1921 by when, in the 5th of January, Stalin writes a very important article, Our Disagreements, where he talks about his arguments with Trotsky, who's presented demands to increase the work discipline in the working class with methods of enforcement, impor- basically sending in the army. Stalin, here again being more rational, by this point Stalin being more rational and less murderous than the rest of everyone else, has become a meme. I uh, think that he'll just snap uh, more than he has before at one point. Uh, But yes, here Stalin argues for methods of persuasion. Quote, Only by persuading and convincing it will be possible to realize the task of uniting the working class, increasing their productivity and the level of trust to the Soviet state. Trust, which is right now extremely necessary, so that we could raise the country in the battle against the total destruction of our economy. Now, what is this destruction of economy? (laughs) Well, let me remind you, we spoke about war communism earlier, (laughs) but uh, I think it's time to look at this in a bit more detail as Stalin will be trying to deal with this issue all year long, trying to write some write some nice laws, and working in the commissariat, who's, who, are, who are kind of tasked with dealing with this issue. See, by, 1929, by 1921, the fighting was almost over, but the country was really, really in poor shape due to this war communism. Production had come to a standstill, and the transport system no longer really transported anything. Confiscation by the state had, at uh, this point, replaced legal commerce and illegal co- uh, and illegal commerce, otherwise known as speculation, was punished by death, which is fun thing to do. Peasants had been ordered to hand specified amounts of their crops over to the government in return for the promise of manufactured goods. Since they were called on to deliver more than they produced and could keep no seed corn, they were not cooperative. As for the cities... Uh, they were totally unrecognizable from what they looked like previously. Uh, there were, of course, always the graffitis on the walls, especially in Moscow, which often read uh, stuff like Save Russia and Kill the Jews and Death to the Bourgeoisie, you know, the usual. Russia's cities were basically falling into pieces. In summer, grass grew between the flagstones and nothing worked in the overcrowded tenements. There was little electricity, and apparently, uh, according to my socialist sources here, the water supply was really lacking as well. Apartment blocks used to be heated centrally by single furnaces, but as these no longer functioned, the apartments would have stayed cold where it were not for their homemade stuffs, which people made of their own, and which uh, later on, in a way, came back in the early 90s, but these, which is quite ironic, were called bourgeoisie. 
The wrought iron pipes pr protruded through the windows of literally every apartment of an eight or ten story buildings. The inhabitants of those apartments went about in rags. And uh, there is a journalist, Walter Duranti, who had at this point arrived in Moscow, and Walter Duranti, uh, he he's used as a major source also in Dan Carlin's series about World War I, so it might be familiar to you. Quote, The city was incredibly broken and dilapidated. Physically and morally, it reminded me of Lille when the French troops entered it in October 1918 after four years of German occupation. The street was full of holes where the water mains had burst and there had been digging in an attempt to clear choked drains. There was also a breakdown in running water and sanitation. Those who lived in old wooden houses did all right, but the inhabitants of buildings, once fitted with modern plumbing, had a terrible time. End quote. St. Petersburg wasn't much better. The winter of 1921 was exceptionally hard. Quote, the cold is extreme and there is intense suffering in the city. Snowstorms have cut us off from the provinces. The supply of provisions has almost ceased. Only half a pound of bread is being issued now. Most of the houses are unheated. At dusk, old women prowl along the big wood pile near the Hotel Astoria, but the sentry is vigilant. End quote. In the countryside, people were often just starving. There was completely nothing to eat. Agriculture had come to a standstill, which resulted in famine. In 1921 and 1922, the Volga area uh, basically suffered such a hunger that there were frequent and well-documented uh, incidents of cannibalism. One Volga peasant, when asked what human flesh tastes like, answered calmly that it was, quote, quite good and does not need much salt. Further east in Bashkiria, authorities report more than 2,000 cases of cannibalism. Quote, we hear that women cut the arms and legs off a human corpse and eat them. Children who die are not taken to the cemetery, but kept for food. End quote. The Volga famine would have been more serious still, had it not been actually for the, for, and surprisingly enough, American Relief Administration, which did a great job and saved about 2 to 3 million lives in these years. The Soviet of People's Commissars wrote, quote, The people of the Soviet Union will never forget the generous help of the American people. And arrested all Soviet citizens who had worked for the organization as potential spies just a bit later. You know, it's a, it's a nice touch, especially if you recall the, the past episode now. And, uh, yeah, I will speak about uh, a book later on, too. It's called The Forsaken, which is about the Americans who will come and work for the Soviet Union in the late 20s, apparently, and about their fate. I, that's uh, This book was sent to us by Dave. Hi, Dave. He's our number one fan. So we'll be using that, and, of course, it'll also go inside the series. Anyhow, the victims of the famine were kind of lucky that the government admitted this ARA at all. A domestic committee for aid to the starving, formed by non-Bolsheviks, were, were, they were all just completely arrested. Its president, the populist white writer Korolenko, who was dying at the time, described the Bolsheviks' action as, quote, politicking, politicking of the worst kind, end quote, and voiced the suspicion that history will show one day that the Bolshevik revolution dealt as severely with gen genuine revolutionaries and socialists as the Tsarist regime. So, you know, even, um, even that, even the socialists from that era kind of hated Bolsheviks, and again, here... Uh, when, when people write about socialists, as, again, this uh, comes from a Western source who has nicely documented all this, uh, th what they really mean are what modern days, what, what in modern day you would call social democrats. Anyhow, the widespread cannibalism was quite shocking. The famine posed a threat to this uh, Bolshevik regime, and not just because the citizens were dying. The behavior of the survivors made for the breakdown of good government. And here I want to give you a quote by uh, by Autobiography of Stalin by Nicholas Basseches. Quote, No one who was ever in that famine area, no one who saw those starving and brutalized people will ever forget the spectacle. Cannibalism was common. The despairing people crept about, emaciated like brown mummies. And in the course of their own destruction, they dragged thousands of people to death with them. 
For in the Great Famine areas, the starving people went in crowds in search of regions in which food was still to be had, and when these hordes fell upon an unprepared village, they were apt to massacre every living person. The inhabitants of the regions not yet starving therefore organized guards and drove away the starving people with rifle and machine gun fire as they appeared. When the intentional relief organization started work, their missions had to be given military protection. The distributors of relief were placed in the middle of a square of troops who saved them from being over overwhelmed by the starving recipients. The famine-stricken victims came as far as Moscow. They encamped in the gigantic square in which are most of Moscow's railway stations, the living lying among the dead." End quote. It is clear that the Bolsheviks had no inkling of the likely outcome of their policies. They were mostly an urban party, as we have seen, as supported by workers, and then speaking about the unity with the Mensheviks, who, in turn, had been supported by the, by the peasants outside in the countryside. And their ignorance of peasant conditions basically were matched only by the optimism of their expectations of what would happen. Just a year before, Russia underwent the worst famine in recent history. Uh, Bukharin told the English writer Arthur Ransom that he was looking onward to a revolution in Europe, remarking, quote, Once civil war ends in Europe, Europe can feed herself. With English and German engineering assistance, we shall soon turn Russia into an effective grain supply for all the working men's republics of the continent, end quote. Well, obviously, not all the peasants were content to fight for scraps of food or passively accept their role as, you know, nice new guinea pig in a great experiment. There was widespread, albeit extremely disorganized, resistance, notably in the Tambov district, where resistance developed into something close to war. The Red Army here used tanks and even aircraft to suppress the rising and also employed a new technique to subdue the insurgents, and this is where the fun begins. The Red Army set up barbed wire perimeters around open spaces in the countryside, and within these spaces, known as mm, camps, uh, they located the families of any peasants suspected of participating in the armed rebellion. If the man did not give himself up with, uh, within three weeks, the family went to Siberia. The young military commander Tukhachevsky was so proud of this new technique that he wrote it up in the journal War and Revolution. Oh boy, must have been just amazing new discoveries, right? Anyhow, most of these rebellions, they were really kind of spontaneous, and they didn't have much of a purpose except to get more food. But this same period also saw protests of a, of a very different kind, really. One of the more tiresome aspects of, of these Soviet histories is the way that... Um, and this also comes into my research, that they always... Uh, always... Uh, describes sailors of the Kronstadt naval base as, quote, the pride, glamour, and glory of the revolution, end quote. And this comes uh, directly from my Marxist.org uh, .org page. See, they had such... They had such prestige, these revolutionary sailors, that it really came to a massive shock to the regime in St. Petersburg when Kronstadt mutinied in 1921. There had been a lot of unrest there. Strikes had been broken out and strikers had been arrested and, you know, while groups of workers being escorted to prison were kind of regular feature of city life at the time, nothing like this had happened before. These guys made an appeal to the pride, glamour and glory of the revolution, where some traditions were still alive. The sailors responded, issuing a proclamation calling for a new government with democratic institutions, free, unrigged elections to the Soviets, and an end to the dictatorship of the party. Obviously, when the authorities ordered the sailors to submit to revolutionary discipline, they mutinied and appealed to the country at large to overthrow the dictatorship of the party. Obviously, this was suppressed. Bloodily. With guns and machine guns and everything else by the Red Army, which went in shooting indiscriminately in March the 18th. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, this is also the anniversary of the Paris Commune, which is another date which was uh, hailed by the Soviet press at the time as another landmark on, in revolutionary history. The party leadership, which was genuinely disturbed at the time by this mutiny, did everything it could to present it in the light which was obviously most favorable to itself. Trotsky, for one, suggested that the sailors had been misled by a white general and that the mutiny was inspired by counter-revolutionaries and foreign agents, probably of the same American relief agency. And uh, this is where another wave of mass arrests of every Soviet citizen ever who works for them start to happen. 
Basically, <laughs> so successfully were foreign communists taken in that those who later came to Moscow were shocked to discover that the episode was rather more than a minor postscript to the Civil War. Nonetheless, the mutiny kind of obliged the leadership to recognize that, yeah, we have some minor issues in the country, you know? And uh, there were various forms of response proposed there, and um, kind of some more in tune with what actually happened, and um, some quite much not. This, at this point, uh, this at this point also brings us to another important article, uh, written by Stalin, uh, which is called The Immediate Task of the Party in the National Question, which was kind of written as theses for the 10th Congress of uh, the Communist Party of Russia, the Bolshevik Party, and it was written in uh, early 1921. I'm going to read from it in full, at least when it comes to it, because uh, this this ties nicely in with what will happen in the 10th Congress. The Capitalist System and National Oppression, 1. Modern nations are the product of a definite epoch, the epoch of rising capitalism. The process of elimination of feudalism and development of capitalism is at the same time a process of the constitution of people into nations. The British, French, Germans and Italians were formed into nations at the same time of the victorious development of capitalism and its triumph over feudal disunity. 2. Where the formation of nations of, on the whole coincide in time with the formation of centralized states, the nations naturally assumed state forms. They developed into independent bourgeoisie national states. This is what happened in Britain, excluding Ireland, in France and Italy. In Eastern Europe, on the contrary, the formation of centralized states accelerated by the needs of self-defense, which was invasion by the Turks, Mongols, etc., took place before feudalism was liquidated, hence before the formation of nations. As a consequence, the nations here did not and could not develop into national states. Instead, several mixed multinational bourgeoisie states were formed, usually consisting of one strong dominant nation and of several weak subject nations. Examples. Austria, Hungary, Russia. 3. In national states like France and Italy, which at first relied mainly on their own national forces, there was, generally speaking, no national oppression. In contrast to that, the multinational states that are based on the domination of one nation, more exactly of the ruling class of that nation, over the other nations are the original home and chief area of national oppression and of national movements. The contradictions between the interests of the dominant nation and those of the subject nations are contradictions which, unless they are resolved, make the stable existence of a multinational state impossible. The tragedy of the multinational bourgeoisie state lies in that it cannot resolve these contradictions, that every attempt on its part to equalize the nations and to protect the national minorities while preserving private property and class inequality usually ends in another failure in a few further aggravation of national conflicts. This is how he describes basically why uh, in the capitalist why in the capitalist nations which are multinational everyone will get oppressed and everything's going to go terribly. I'm going to skip some uh, some of these theses that he writes and skip over to the sixth one. Thus, the post-war period reveals a somber picture of national enmity, inequality, oppression, conflict, war, and imperialist brutality on the part of the nations of the civilized countries, both towards one another and towards unequal nations. On the one hand, there are a few <clears throat> great powers which oppress and exploit all the dependent and <clears throat> independent, and uh, there he puts in brackets actually totally dependent, national states, and there is a struggle of these powers among themselves in order to monopolize the exploitation of the national states. On the other hand, there is a struggle of the dependent and <clears throat> independent national states against the unbearable oppression of the, again, the, all of this is in, in quotes here in the text, great powers. There is a struggle of the national states among themselves in order to enlarge their national territories. There is a struggle of each national state against the national minorities that it is oppressing. Lastly, there is an intensification of the liberation movement in the colonies against the great powers and an aggravation of the national conflicts both within these powers and also within the national states, which, as a rule, contain a number of national minorities. Such is the picture of peace bequeathed by the imperialist war. Bourgeoisie society has proven to be utterly incapable of solving the national question. And uh, there he goes on explaining what will the Soviets do in this national question. 
<laughs> even though at this point this national question is somewhat on the third plane, but it will tie in on what Stalin will want to achieve in this Congress, and then we'll speak about a bit uh, about Trotsky. Even though we have immediate problems of um, of cannibalism going on, Stalin kind of thinks, hey, national minorities. Oh well. Number one. And this also kind of ties into the current problems of capitalism and everything so far discussed in this episode. So, what will the Soviets do with this uh, national issue? Number one. Where does private property and capital inevitably disunite people, as they have done so far, and you have succeeded in your war communism, foment national strike and intensify national oppression, collective property and labor just as inevitably unite people, strike at the root of national strife and abolish national oppression. The existence of capitalism without national oppression is just as inconceivable as the existence of socialism without the liberation of oppressed nations without national freedom. Chauvinism and national strife are inevitable, unavoidable, so long as the peasantry, who are starving and eating their own dead by now, and the petty bourgeoisie in general, full of nationalist prejudices, follows the bourgeoisie. On the contrary, national peace and national freedom can be regarded as ensured if the peasantry follows the proletariat, i.e. if the proletariat dictatorship is ensured. Hence, the victory of the Soviets and the establishment of the proletarian dictatorship are a fundamental condition for abolishing national oppression, establishing national equality, and guaranteeing the rights of national minorities. I, I don't even have to make jokes here, guys. Number two. The experience of the Soviet Revolution has fully confirmed this thesis. The establishment of the Soviet system in Russia and the proclamation of the right of nations to secede changed completely the relations between the laboring masses of the different nationalities in Russia, struck at the root of the old national enmity, removed the ground for national oppression and won for the Russian workers the confidence of their brothers of other nationalities, not only in Russia but also in Europe and Asia, and heightened this confidence into enthusiasm, into readiness to fight for the common cause. And common cause is basically not not dying at this this point, really. So, uh, giving on, uh, giving on further, because this point number two about how everything has been great so far in the Soviet Union leads us into uh, point number three, because these these this is these are just getting really really long here. Three. But the existence of Soviet republics, even of the smallest dimensions, is a deadly menace to imperialism the imperialism who are right now, again, helping them make sure people don't starve to death, really. The menace lies not only in that by breaking away from imperialism, the Soviet republics were transformed from colonies and semi-colonies into really independent states. And uh, here comes into mind the Soviet joke, uh, true independence means that, uh, you know, means that nobody is dependent from you thereby depriving the imperialists of some extra territory and extra income, but also primarily in that the very existence of the Soviet republics, every step they take in suppressing the bourgeoisie and in strengthening the proletariat dictatorship, continues tremendous agitation against capitalism and imperialism, agitation for the liberation of the dependent countries from imperialist bondage, and is an insuperable element in the disintegration and disorganization of capitalism in all its forms. This is really gonna get funny later on, as, as again, this is for the 10th Congress. Remember this fact. Anyhow, uh, further on, they speak about federation, how it's gonna be the best form, and what to do with these things, and then uh, Stalin comes to the, well, what should be done to strengthen these national minorities. This is kind of the chapter 3 of all this speech. The immediate task of the Russian Communist Party. The policy of Tsarism, fr from this, uh, the immediate task. The policy of Tsarism, the policy of landlords and the bourgeoisie towards these minority peoples was to kill whatever germs of statehood existed among them, to mutilate their culture, to restrict their languages, to keep them in ignorance, and lastly, as far as possible, to Russify them. The result of this policy was the underdevelopment and political backwardness of these peoples. Uh, yeah, when the Russification things start going on, when Stalin himself gets power, where. are um, we're gonna have a bit of a, a bit of a different story here, but yeah, again, capitalism is bad. Uh, Soviets are good. Soviets did a lot to help people reach maturity, and you know this whole question about national minorities, and you know making sure that uh, they shouldn't be united in some pan is pan Islamism, as Stalin calls the idea of Arab people joining and everything else. 
uh, yeah, this the, he considers this imp- this important and thinks that all these problems that he seeks to destroy come from the kind of uh, come from this imperialist capitalism. Meanwhile, let's switch back to Trotsky. Well, these real problems are going on, that is. See, uh, Trotsky had discovered that the conditions of civil war and war communism a magnificent basis on which to build the future. Since the Red Army had less to do now that hostilities were ended, uh, they Trotsky thought that it should be converted into an army of labor. As, um, as a biographer who really, really admires Trotsky puts it, quote, Nothing could be simpler than that, than that the army, before releasing its men, should take a census of their productive skills, mark every soldier's trade in his service book, then direct him straight from the demobilization point to the working place where he was wanted. End quote. While describing uh, the idea as imaginative, the biographer concedes that it had some drawbacks. Quote, its flaw was that the released soldier, only anxious to reunite with his family or look for a better living, was likely to abandon the working place to which he had been directed. Yeah, Mm-mm. to speak about Captain Obvious here. Trotsky tried to deal with this problem by planning communal feeding centers to be located at the workplace, but these could never be more than plans in a country starving to death. He began his militarization of labor by placing railway workers under martial law. Because, you know, threatening to shoot people while they, while they are already starving is the best thing ever. This, uh, his move about this placing in martial law, was a move that met with, with considerable resistance from, from the trade unions. Unions were not yet as they would become later on, but uh, in the party jargon they were called transmission belts. That essentially conveyed the directives of the party to the shop floor. And, you know, now when you look back at these Trotsky's ideas, you know, it's... Um, it's not even a surprise anymore that they're extremely coercive and basically come down to we need forced labor and it'll be better for everyone, but they're kind of, you know, naive. Because I don't know what you have to think to assume that now that peace had finally come after like seven years of brutal civil war, that um, there could be like any approval or assent to the principle of further conscription and military direction that this peasant population that had basically seen its land ruined and its families starved to death that they would even want to conscript to the army. But, you know, this is Trotsky. And for all of you Trotsky fans out there, no, no. This guy, even though uh, even though often portrayed as some sort of a good guy, was just as much as a terrible murderer as, you know, the rest of them. But yeah, however productive these ideas themselves might have been possibly... And we will see Stalin implement something kind of similar within a decade or few. And, uh, hey, hey, spoilers. What we're talking about massive collectivization efforts and brutal pen and pen penalties for those. At this point, party kind of lacked any ideas and muscled, basically imposed these Trotskyist crazy ideas and weird, r- weird Stalin national minority ideas, which he will drop when he will become extensively, extensively pro-Russian and will start destroying other national minorities, which is another nice aspect of Stalin, because I was surprised to read his uh, his thesis from this era. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's kind of weird that he really defends them here, while, again, the country is starving. But yeah. This brings us to the 10th Congress, which is going to be fun, especially uh, like if you did, like I said, memorize the bit, what was Stalin writing about with how capitalism causes issues with national minorities, which again, for which he's responsible with for now. You see, in this 10th Party Congress, Lenin, who at that point had privately in letters conceded the failure of communism as such and, you know, need to revert to an exchange economy as he thought it was not possible to change people's mentality and age-long habits overnight. Uh, yeah, Lenin, this guy whom we made a whole series about, announced at this 10th Party Congress the change of direction, which is known as, you might recall this from previous episodes, new economic policy. Yep, we're back to Nepmans. Uh, yeah, uh, we made a whole episode just dedicated to new economic policy, but just to explain, at its heart here was a concession to the peasants, because they literally were dying on the streets. In place of barter and forced grain deliveries, the peasants would now meet their obligations by paying a tax in kind, and they were permitted now to sell the rest of their crops. 
In order to kind of create the other end of market economy, Lenin also authorized private trade, or speculation, for which Stalin later shoot people dead, and, you know, private industry, uh, in the shape of kind of man manufacturing enterprises, employing up to 40 persons. Yeah, the, we made a whole episode about it, and uh, this nip... Well, obviously, it smelled of complete ideological heresy. But, you know, they tried to justify it there. And, you know, I will not go into many details, but just think about what Stalin had wrote, even including in his uh, question of national, national issues here. Lenin himself wrote a series of articles that uh, kind of set about the crazy task of determining the nature of the revolution of 1917, and according to categories such as bourgeoisie, democratic, and socialist. And, you know, this was kind of a weird uh, point here, where you could see that the, the, there was an attempt to make the events defined according to the pre-existing categories, kind of, and this is coupled with the awesome knowledge that it was possible to make mistaken classifications. History, again, by Lenin, was required to pro proceed according to plan. So this is kind of crazy. And yeah, go listen to my Lenin series nap episode. But um, for Stalin, obviously, you know, he has just uh, yelled at capitalists in detail. He's been angry. He's been dealing with this national question. And he was, at first, at least privately, completely and directly opposed to that. But, uh, you know, Stalin is one who changes his mind often. At least, you know, he knows how to play the long game. He knows how to wait. So, in um, December 18, 1921, Joseph writes an essay called The Prospects, which will be today's uh, Ask Uncle Joe section here, which I will read in full, completely in full, because at this point, the 10th Congress has passed, and Stalin now has to kind of uh, attempt to justify this NEP philosophy too. He has to deal with these Trotskyist ultra-revolutionary ideas. And at this point, he's already starting to build up his team and his kind of cater department, his human resources. He has become a secretary of sorts. And from him, the general secretary position will arrive later on. That's for the next episode. This <laughs> this is more of a general lens thing, but where we try to get into the mind of Stalin on his answers to these minor questions. But yeah, this, uh, this is how Stalin tries to explain the new economic policy and some other things, including his um, interesting views on the national question. So, here you go. The prospects. The international situation is paramount uh, to importance in the life of Russia. It is so not only because Russia, like every other country in Europe, is linked by innumerable threats with the neighboring capitalist countries, but also and primarily because being a Soviet country and therefore a <clears throat> menace to the bourgeoisie world, she finds herself, as a result of the course of events, surrounded by a hostile camp of bourgeoisie states. It is obvious that the state of affairs in that camp, the relation of the contending forces within that camp, cannot be of paramount importance for Russia. The chief factor that characterizes the international situation is that the period of open war has been replaced by a period of so-called peaceful struggle, that there has arisen some degree of mutual recognition of the contending forces and armistice between them, between the Entente as the head of the bourgeoisie counter-revolution on one hand, and Russia as the advanced detachment of the proletarian revolution on the other. The struggle has shown that we the workers, are not yet strong enough to put an end to imperialism forthwith. But the struggle has also shown that they, the bourgeoisie, are no longer strong enough to strangle Soviet Russia. As a consequence of this, the fright or horror with which the proletarian revolution aroused in the world bourgeoisie when, for example, the Red Army was advancing on Warsaw, has disappeared, evaporated. At the same time, the boundless enthusiasm with which the workers of Europe received almost every bit of news about Soviet Russia is also disappearing. A period of sober weighing up of forces has set in. A period of molecular work in training and accumulating forces for future battles. Yes, yes, I, this is actually the... He will explain NEP in the prospects here. He just ties it in with everything else, don't worry. That does not mean that the certain degree of equilibrium of forces that was established already at the beginning of 1921 has remained unchanged. Not at all. 
Recovering from the blows of revolution, sustained as a consequence of the imperialist war and pulling itself together, the world bourgeoisie passed from defense to an attack on its own workers, and making skillful use of the industrial crisis, hurled the workers back into worse conditions of existence. The brackets here, reduction of wages, lower working day, mass unemployment, and the brackets. Yeah, this is this is just in the same. Con this is just after the Congress of Nep. The results of that offensive were exceptionally severe for Germany, where, besides everything else, the precipitous fall in the range of in the rate of exchange of the mark still further worsened the conditions of the workers. That gave rise to a powerful movement within the working class, particularly in Germany, for the creation of a united workers' front and for the establishment of workers' government. A movement that called for agreement and joint struggle against the common enemy on the part of all the more or less revolutionary groups among the working class, from the moderates to the so-called extremists. There is no ground for doubting that in the struggle for a workers' government, the communists will be in the front ranks, for such a struggle must lead to the further demoralization of the bourgeoisie and to the conversion of the president communist parties into genuine mass workers' parties. But the matter is by no means confined to the offensive of the bourgeoisie against its own workers. The bourgeoisie is aware that it cannot crush its own workers unless it curbs Russia. Hence, the ever-increasing activity of the bourgeoisie in preparing a new offensive against Russia, a more complex and thorough offensive than all the previous ones. Of course, trade and other treaties are being and will be concluded with Russia, and this is of immense importance for Russia. But it must not be forgotten that the trading and all other sorts of missions and associations that are now pouring into Russia, trading with her and aiding her, are at the same time most efficient spy agencies of the world bourgeoisie. And that, therefore, the world bourgeoisie now knows Soviet Russia, knows her weak and strong sides better than any time before, a circumstance fraught with grave danger in the event of new interventionist actions. Of course, the friction over the Eastern question has been reduced to misunderstandings, but it must not be forgotten that Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan and the Far East are being flooded with agents of imperialism, gold and other blessings in order to create an economic and not economic cordon around Soviet Russia. It scarcely needs proof that the so-called peace conference in Washington promises us nothing really peaceful. Oh yeah, and here I also want to interrupt, uh, interrupt Comrade Stalin here to talk about this East thing. See, I was, uh, I was sent another book, this excellent book called Setting the East Ablaze, Lenin's Dream of an Empire in Asia by uh, Peter Hopkirk, which I will use because it's amazing. It will be all about kind of um, the continuation of the great game between uh, the Soviets and the, uh, and the British in the Far East, but I have yet to read it fully. I'm, a, I'm approximately in chapter two, but this is also coming, just so you know that uh, research goes quite well. Anyhow, carrying on with uh, Mr. Stalin's work. <clears throat> of course, we are on <clears throat> very best terms with Poland, with Romania, and with Finland. But it must not be forgotten that these countries, especially Poland and Romania, are vigorously arming with the assistance of the Entente, are preparing for war, and against whom if not against Russia? That now, as in the past, they constitute the immediate reserves of imperialism, that it was they who recently landed on Russian territory, in brackets, for espionage purposes, White Guard, Savnikov, and Petlura, Petlura detachments. All these facts and much more of a similar kind are evidently separate links in the whole activity of preparing a new attack on Russia. A combination of economic and military struggle, a combined assault from within and from without, such is the most likely form of this attack. Whether we succeed in making this attack impossible, or if it is launched and turning it into a deadly weapon against the world bourgeoisie, depends upon the vigilance of the communists in the rear and in the army, upon the success of our work in the economic field, and lastly, upon the staunchness of the Red Army. Such, in general, is the external situation. No less complex, and if you like, peculiar, is the internal situation in Soviet Russia. It may be described in these words. A struggle to strengthen the alliance between the workers and the peasants on a new economic basis for the development of industry, agriculture and transport. Or in other words, a struggle to maintain and strengthen the dictatorship of the proletariat in a situation of economic ruin. 
There is a theory, current in the West, that the workers can take and hold power only in a country where they constitute the majority, or, at all events, where the people engaged in industry constitute the majority. It is indeed of these grounds that Messers, the Kautskys, deny the legitimacy of the proletarian revolution in Russia, where the proletariat is in the minority. This theory is based on the tacit assumption that the petty bourgeoisie, primarily the peasantry, cannot support the workers in their struggle for power. That the mass of the peasantry constitutes a reserve for the bourgeoisie and not of the proletariat. The historical basis of this assumption lies in the fact that at critical moments in the West, France and Germany, the petty bourgeoisie, in brackets, the peasantry, were usually found on the side of bourgeoisie. And, uh, hello, Mr. My Mike Duncan, 1848 in particular, in France, attempts at proletarian revolution in Germany after 19, and etc. The reasons for this are, number one, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie revolution took place in the West under the leadership of the bourgeoisie, because at that time the proletariat merely, merely served as the battering ram of the revolution. There, the peasantry received land and emancipation from the feudal bondage from, from the hands of the bourgeoisie, so to speak, and, as a consequence, the influence of the bourgeoisie over the peasantry was already then considered to be assured. Number two. More than a half century elapsed from the beginning of the bourgeoisie revolution in the West to the first attempt at proletarian revolution. During that period, the peasantry managed to give rise to a powerful rural bourgeoisie, exercising strong influence in the countryside, which served as a connecting bridge between the peasantry and big urban capital, thereby strengthening the hegemony of the bourgeoisie over the peasantry. It was in that hysterical situation that the above-mentioned theory arose. An entirely different picture is revealed in Russia. First, in contrast to the West, the bourgeoisie revolution in Russia, February, March 1917, took place under the leadership of the proletariat in fierce battles against the bourgeoisie, in the course of which the peasantry rallied around the proletariat as around their leader. Secondly, the successful attempt at proletarian revolution in Russia in October 1917, also in contrast to the West, did not begin half a century after the bourgeoisie revolution, but immediately after it, within a matter of six to eight months, during which period it was, of course, impossible for, for a powerful and organized rural bourgeoisie to spring up from among the peasantry. Moreover, the big bourgeoisie that was overthrown in October 1917 was never able to recover. The latter circumstance still further strengthened the alliance between the workers and the peasants. That is why the Russian workers, although constituting a minority of the population of Russia, nevertheless found themselves the masters of the country, won the sympathy and support of the vast majority of the population, primarily of the peasantry, and took and held power. Whereas, in spite of all theories, the bourgeoisie found itself isolated, was left without the peasant reserves. From this, it follows that... The above-mentioned theory that the proletariat must constitute the majority of the population is inadequate and incorrect from the standpoint of Russian reality, or, at all events, is interpreted to, in too simple and vulgar a manner by the Kautskys. Under the present historical conditions, the actual alliance between the proletariat and the toiling peasantry that was formed in the course of the revolution is the basis of Soviet power in Russia. Number 3. It is the duty of the communists to maintain and strengthen that actual alliance. The whole point in the present case is, is that the forms of this alliance are not always the same. Previously, during the war we had to deal with what was chiefly a military-political alliance, i.e. we expelled the landlords from Russia and gave the peasants the land for their use, and when the landlords went to war to recover their property, we fought them and upheld the gains of the revolution. In return, the peasants provided the food for the workers and men for the army. That was one form of the alliance. Now that the war is over and danger no longer threatens the land, the old form of alliance is not adequate anymore. Another form of alliance is needed. Now it is no longer a matter of saving the land for the peasants, but of ensuring the peasants the right to freely dispose of the produce of that land. In the absence of such right, there will inevitably be a further diminution of the crop area, a progressive decline of agriculture, paralysis of transport and industry due to forage shortage. Demoralization of the army, due to food shortage. And, as a result, follow this the inevitable collapse of the actual alliance between the workers and the peasants. It scarcely needs proof that possession by the state of a certain minimum of grain stocks is the mainspring of the revival of industry and the preservation of the Soviet state. Kronstadt, in the spring of 1921, was a warning that the old form of alliance was obsolete and that a new form was needed, an economic form that would be of economic advantage both to the workers and to the peasants. And here comes the bomb. That is the key to an understanding of the new economic policy. Okay, uh, just a random question here. 
how much had actually Stalin spoke about the how capitalism is bad here? Did he actually, previous to this sentence, ever even spoke about new economic policy? No. So, I don't even know. Abolition of the surplus appropriation system and of other similar obstacles was the first step along the new road that freed the hands of the small producer and gave an impetus to the production of more food, raw materials and other produce. It will not be difficult to understand the colossal importance of this step if it is borne in mind that Russia is making the same mass onrush towards the development of productive forces as North America experienced after the Civil War. There is no doubt that while releasing the productive energy of the small producer and ensuring certain advantages for him, this step will, however, put him in a position, bearing in mind that the state remains in control of transport and industry, in which he will be compelled to bring grist to the mill of the Soviet state. So yeah, Stalin, uh, Stalin stands on the idea that capitalism is bad, we are not bad, therefore this is not capitalism. It totally makes no sense, but... Hey, even Stalin, who just recently, uh, just a few months ago, was bashing out this, is on the lines of trying to defend this new economic policy because, well, uh, this is not capitalism, because capitalism is bad, and we're not. I'm sorry for this kind of, again, more philosophical episode, but uh, we spoke about the factual stuff of new economical, new economical policy more in, again, Lenin episodes, and I hope you like this one next Stalin episode we shall be discussing like how Stalin built up his whole team and his full rise to power. And this episode you can see how Stalin can um, basically shift reality as often his biographers also do it. Hope you learned something new about the way Stalin and the Bolsheviks thought. Hope you knew uh, another thing about the minor issues of war communism in the Soviet Union. And see you next time. Do свидания, товарищ. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits.